Today I'm learning about the Battle of Trafalgar. Wow, wow, that is a huge disparity. Definitely seeing the superiority of the British Navy here, my goodness. Okay, so we are getting back into the Napoleonic Wars. I had a bit of a bump in subscribers the last few days, so if you are new to this channel, welcome. This channel is not just about doing reaction videos, but it's also about me actually learning this stuff. And I've really enjoyed learning alongside you guys because you guys teach me so much down in the comments. So anyway, even though this video is not from Epic History TV that we're gonna be watching today, I did have a lot of you guys tell me that I needed to watch the Battle of Trafalgar before moving on to the next video in our Napoleonic Wars series. Now the Battle of Trafalgar is something that we do learn here in America in history. It's just that it's been like over 20 years since I've studied it so I don't really remember a whole lot about it. <laughs> so what I would like to do first before jumping into the video is just kind of get a very very quick overview of the Battle of Trafalgar so I kind of know what I'm gonna get into here. So we're gonna look for a Battle of Trafalgar. Okay so according to Wikipedia it was fought on October 21st 1805 which is the same year that Austerlitz happened. It was between the British Royal Navy and the French and Spanish navies. It was fought during the War of the Third Coalition. Don't know what that is. Let's very quickly what is the War of the Third Coalition was a European conflict spanning the years of 1803 to 1806. So Napoleon was fighting against the UK, the Holy Roman Empire, the Russian Empire, Naples, Sicily, and Sweden. It's an interesting coalition. This probably is going to sound stupid, but how do you fight the Holy Roman Empire? <laughs> is this a holdover from the Roman Empire? Like, I could click on it and read that, but that's just going to- well, this thing just popped up. Let's see. The Holy Roman Empire was a multi-ethnic complex of territories in Western and Central Europe that developed during the early Middle Ages and continued until its dissolution in 1806. Okay, I- that still doesn't really tell me much. Obviously, I'm probably gonna learn more about it in depth in the future, but just kind of give me a very quick overview of, of what that is and how they, I don't know, fought. So we have Admiral Villeneuve. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is embarrassing. I can't pronounce this stuff. Villanueve? Obviously it sounds Spanish, but it says it's French. Probably a very fine line between French and Spanish in some aspects. I studied Latin, so I'm not really super familiar with the more Romance languages. So basically, Napoleon wanted to take control of the English Channel so that he could invade England. They ran into Admiral Lord Nelson, which I have heard about. Like, he's a really famous name, even to Americans, I feel like. And Lord Nelson. Nelson took his fleet into the Atlantic Ocean, obviously, along the southwest coast of Spain off Cape Trafalgar, which I'm assuming is why the battle was called the Battle of Trafalgar. I don't know where Cape Trafalgar is though, so let's take a look. Where is that? Obviously it's on the coast of Spain, but where? Cabo Trafalgar. Okay. It's down there by Gibraltar, which I still have to learn more about, by the way. Okay, so it's, it's, it's on down there. It's on down there. So Admiral Lord Nelson looks like he did most of the traveling here, going all the way down there to the southern coast of Spain. Let me zoom out here. Yeah, he kind of went a long ways here. So the Spanish fleet doesn't look like it had to go very far. France probably was hanging out here in... This is the Mediterranean Sea, right? The whole thing. So I hope this video kind of tells me where these ships were located, because I don't know if, uh, obviously, if Napoleon was trying to take control of the English Channel. He, his ships would have been like uh, probably in the northern coast of France somewhere. Did they have a lot of ships though? I'm assuming they had a lot of ships in the Mediterranean as well, right? Since they were battling with some areas in Italy and the, uh, I'm guessing the Holy Roman Empire was probably located in Italy as well somewhere, at least headquartered, I don't know. Okay, so it looks like the British outmaneuvered the French and the Spanish here. Curious about these stats though. So on France and Spain side, we had 33 ships, five frigates, and two brigs. I don't know what a frigate or a brig is, so if you guys want to explain that to me, let me know. Uh, and then we have 27 ships on the British side with four frigates.
Harper gets one scoot is that called schooner and then one cutter. Explain to me what these ships are exactly. I know the US Navy and and really any navy around the world has like frigates today. I've not seen brigs, schooners, or cutters though in like modern navies where those kind of phased out at some point. Casualties and losses we have uh way more wow wow that is a huge disparity. There's like almost 4,400 killed on the French and Spanish side. Seven to eight thousand captured, 2,500 or so wounded, and then on the British side we have 458 killed and about 1,200 wounded. One ship of the line was destroyed. What is a ship of the line? 21 ships of the line captured. Uh yeah so <laughs> Definitely seeing the superiority of the British Navy here, my goodness. This is crazy, the uh, numbers on this. Okay, so since I have been looking at more like land maneuvers and stuff, I'm gonna be interested if this video shows like more naval maneuvers. I don't know what they would be exactly, but I'm sure that there are ways that you position your ships to kind of attack or cut off or I don't know. Like, I don't know what you have to do exactly to win a naval battle other than you just try to shoot at the other ship. <laughs> also, especially with these battle videos where it's showing maneuvers and stuff. I'm going to try and make the uh, video screen a little bit bigger so that you can see it a little bit more because I know it might have been a little bit too small on some of my previous videos. So let me know if that works. Let me know if you guys can see it okay. If you're still having trouble seeing it, I might have to like swap me with the video and make me small and the video big. So just kind of let me know what you guys would prefer with that. Oh, and this video that we're going to be watching is from the Kings and Generals channel, which you guys have highly, 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 highly recommended recommended to me, but this is going to be my very first video from that channel, so it'll be interesting to see kind of what their style is and how they uh, kind of go about stuff. Alright, so without further ado, let's learn about Trafalgar. Napoleon Bonaparte kept the whole of Europe in fear for more than a decade. And although the Napoleonic Wars were predominantly a land conflict, many of his political and military decisions were informed by the dominance of the British fleet at sea, and the naval actions that were fought earlier in the war. Among them was the last great sea battle fought under sail, the Battle of Trafalgar. French victories at Marengo and Hohenlinden in 1800 forced Austria to sue for a separate peace, leaving the United Kingdom as the leading member of the Second Coalition. Napoleon's forces dominated on land. So uh, obviously, I just read about the Third Coalition. He's talking about the Second Coalition, so I'm guessing there's a First Coalition <laughs> somewhere. Maybe there are more coalitions that come after this. So, uh, okay, so coalitions are a thing that I need to learn about in this. This is the first time I have heard these terms being used, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. Is it just different allies coming together in each different coalition? And does it change, I guess, throughout the course of the wars? Member of the Second Coalition. Napoleon's forces dominated on land, so the only way for the United Kingdom to continue the war was via naval actions. Hmm. The British Navy was blockading France from receiving foreign goods, and in turn, forced Prussia, Russia, Denmark and Sweden to ally against Britain to defend the trading routes. While the Russian Navy was in its winter harbours, the British attacked Copenhagen in 1801 and forced Denmark to leave the alliance. When the Russian Tsar Paul I died a month later, his heir, Alexander I, was more lenient towards the United Kingdom and the anti-British Union ceased to exist. France had its share of problems. One of its colonies, Haiti, had revolted in 1791. Napoleon decided to send an expeditionary force to restore French rule over the island and its lucrative sugar industry in late 1801. I actually didn't know that Haiti was a French colony. Obviously I know all of the Europeans had colonies down in the Caribbean, but I don't exactly know what is what. That's interesting um, to learn that Haiti was a French colony. There's a lot of history there to learn about too. The British fleet chased the expedition across the Atlantic Ocean. The island wow. was blockaded and the French received no supplies or reinforcements. Chased them all the it way was clear that neither side could strike the final blow and a peace treaty was signed in March of 1802 at Amiens. 
the British promised to return the French colonies and leave Malta and Egypt, while Napoleon had to rescind control of Naples and the Papal States. For the first time in a decade, Europe was at peace. Napoleon sent a new expedition to Haiti, but it failed. Holding on to the colonies proved to be extremely difficult, so in April of 1803, the vast territory of Louisiana was sold to the United States. The Haitian expedition, and the fact that Napoleon was asserting control over Switzerland, was worrisome for the United Kingdom. On the other hand, the Fr Actually, I'm going to go back and listen to that, uh, what he said leading up to the, the uh, Louisiana Purchase. But yeah, like for the United States, the Louisiana Purchase was a huge deal. Eventually for us, you know, it, we eventually settled that area. It added the whole like Midwest to the country. I know a lot of you guys mentioned that Napoleon is the one who is responsible for selling it to the United States. We're actually not taught it that way here. We're just taught that France did it. And so a lot of Americans, I think, are completely unaware that it was Napoleon who was in charge at that time and he's the one that sold it. I feel like they probably mentioned that in history class and our textbooks, but by and large, we just remember it's France that sold us the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Holding on to the colonies proved to be extremely difficult, so in April of 1803, the vast territory of Louisiana was sold to the United States. Just so they could the Haitian it expedition anymore. and the yeah. fact that Napoleon was asserting control over Switzerland was worrisome for the United Kingdom. On the other hand, the French demands for Britain to leave Malta and Egypt were left unheeded. Napoleon started preparing a new force at Boulogne to invade the British Isles, but it was the United Kingdom who declared the war that would be later known as the War of the Third Coalition in May of 1803. This is the first I've heard of this term. Napoleon was not expecting the renewal of hostilities, and his fleet was scattered across various harbours, with 21 ships of the line in Brest, 12 in Toulon, and 9 more in the Atlantic. The superior British navy blockaded both ports. Napoleon developed a plan in the summer of 1804. One of his fleets needed to break the blockade, move into the open sea, then attack the part of the English navy blockading another harbour and unite with the portion of the French fleet stationed there. That would have allowed the French to get the army at Boulogne across the English Channel. The situation changed for the better for the French in October when the British sunk some Spanish vessels. This provoked Spain to declare war on the United Kingdom and ally itself to France in December. Napoleon now had the numbers to implement his plan. In late March of 1805, the French commander at Toulon, Vice Admiral Pierre Villeneuve, ordered his fleet to sail out. He managed to evade the loose blockade set by British commander Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. It seems that the British commanders were sure that Napoleon would try to land a force in Italy, so the majority of Nelson's vessels were around Sardinia. Oh, he's However, on the Villeneuve was implementing Napoleon's plan. He passed the Straits of Gibraltar in early April, was joined by some Spanish ships, and continued towards the Caribbean. Nelson got this intelligence only in late April and started his pursuit across he's the Atlantic. Chase them all the, way down? the French wow. arrived at the Caribbean Sea Basin in May and captured a few British outposts. Nelson reached the area in June, but was still one step behind Villeneuve. Despite that, the French weren't able to inflict much- It's crazy to me that they are fighting over in the colonies in the Caribbean instead of dealing with just fighting over in the mainland where their ultimate goals are. Obviously, there is some strategy behind that, but it's just crazy to me that they would waste that time going all the way to the colonies. <laughs> but if your strategy is to invade the British Isles, then why are you wasting time going to the Caribbean? It's like they're fighting these proxy wars in the colonies for some reason. So explain that to me. Why, why are they bothering chasing each other all the way to the Caribbean? Yeah, I did not expect uh, the Caribbean stuff to be happening, I thought that this was going to be purely up in Europe. ...damage to the local British colonies and started moving back to Europe, arriving in the second half of behind Villeneuve. Despite that, the French weren't able to inflict much damage to the local British colonies and started moving back to Europe, arriving in the second half of July. <laughs> 
A smaller British fleet pointless. under Vice Admiral Calder was ordered to stop Villeneuve, but the subsequent battle near Cape Finisterre was indecisive. Still, this encounter prevented the French from reaching Brest to lift the blockade, and they returned to Cadiz. At the same time, Austria and Russia joined the Third Coalition, and Napoleon had to march his army stationed in Boulogne to the east, which meant that the invasion of the British Isles was postponed. Nelson was appointed the overall commander of the Royal Navy, and as the Allied French-Spanish Armada concentrated in Cadiz, he sent the majority of his fleet off the coast of France to block Villeneuve. By the end of September, he joined the fleet personally. Villeneuve received an order from Napoleon to move towards Italy, but ignored it. On the 18th of October, the French commander received a new order to stay in Cadiz and wait for his replacement. Once again, the order was neglected and the Allied fleet went to sea on the 20th. On the 21st, Villeneuve's navy was getting close to the Straits of Gibraltar. Nelson allowed the French to move as far away from Cadiz as possible to prevent them from retreating. However, by dawn the British vessels were detected. Villeneuve didn't expect Nelson's navy to be so strong, so he ordered his ships back to the harbour. This manoeuvre failed due to lack of training, and the Allied fleet ended up with an incoherent line. The usual this obviously was before radio, all of that stuff. How in the world did they communicate these fleet-wide maneuvers back in the day? Were the ships required to sail just super close together so that they could communicate? So yeah, let me know what is the communication method for navies at this point in history? Tactic of the age was to approach a foe and enter a shooting match. So the fate of the battle was decided by the quality of the ships, crew training, and sheer luck. Instead, Nelson divided his fleet into two halves to attack the Allies' broadside. He was personally leading the Northern Group, that had 13 ships of the line, with his flagship Victory in front, while Vice Admiral Collingwood's squadron of 14 ships of the line was to the south, led by the flagship Royal Sovereign. By midday, the distance between also what is the broadside south, led by the flagship Royal Sovereign. By midday, the distance between the two navies was just five kilometers. They were off the coast of Cape Trafalgar, and Nelson issued his famous order. England expects that every man will do his duty. Royal Sovereign was recently repaired and was faster than most ships so the wind moved it dangerously close to the enemy line, while the other ships in the squadron were lagging behind. At 12.20, Royal Sovereign fired the first volley upon Santa Anna and Forgo, and these vessels shot back. Collingwood's flagship was attacked by four enemy ships. Only 15 minutes later, Belle Isle arrived and covered the right board of Royal Sovereign. More English vessels moved into the fray and tried to cut the Allied line, but Collingwood was outnumbered at the initial point of contact. So it looks to me so far that what they, they have to do is kind of sail up between ships in the line because I'm assuming their guns were on the sides of the ship so they had to kind of get side by side in order to fire upon each other. Also what type of guns or I'm assuming they're more like cannons actually from what I've seen in you know movies and other things. It looks like that there are more like cannons that are firing at each other. Was there a certain type of cannon that uh, naval ships would use versus like on land? To cut the Allied line, but Collingwood was outnumbered at the initial point of contact. Still, the positioning of the Allied Navy didn't allow its second line ships to assist, and by 1400 the majority of the first line vessels were either sunk or surrendered. To the north, Nelson's squadron got close to the enemy line by 12.20, but the wind was calming, and that made Nelson's ships a very slow target. His refusal to fight using traditional line tactics was detrimental at this point of the battle, as none of his ships were able to shoot, while the enemy was sending volley yeah, after okay. volley. Despite casualties, the, the flagship the victory was moving forward. 
nelson ordered a fake maneuver to make the enemy think that his ships would form up in a line but instead he then ordered one more turn and victory ended up between the french flagship bocanteur sure and the smaller yeah, sure redoubtable this allowed nelson's ship to use the guns on both sides the french ships needed to turn and victory used that to take bocanteur out of the game However, Victory itself was taking massive damage from Redoubtable. The French ship was also using sharpshooters, and at 1315, one of their shots wounded Nelson. It was clear that this wound- Okay, so I'm assuming sharpshooters are just men on the ship with a gun, you know, aiming at the enemy ship and trying to kill whoever they could on deck. So yeah, I'm starting to kind of see some of the maneuvers that you would do with these naval battles. It just makes me think how crazy advanced navies are today. Like, I don't know really about modern day navies, but from what I have seen, it looks like, you know, you can pretty much shoot 360 in any direction with the type of weapons that are on ships these days. Plus you have like the guided missiles, so they can pretty much aim wherever they want to, which makes maneuvers like these obsolete, I'm assuming, but I don't know. Do modern navies still practice a lot of these types of maneuvers? Team 15, one of their shots wounded Nelson. It was oh, clear that okay. this wound was deadly. Redoubtable's crew attempted to board Victory, but the British managed to stop them. So, was the sharpshooter actually aiming right at Nelson purposely to try and take him out? Or was it just like a lucky shot? He didn't know who he was shooting? You know, what's the story behind that? Crew attempted to board Victory, but the British managed to stop them. Victory was soon reinforced by Temeraire, which moved across Redoubtable's left board and started shooting. And by 1420, Redoubtable was captured by the crew of Temeraire. To the north, British Neptune entered into a battle with Spanish Santisima Trinidad and managed to take it out of the fight. By 1400, it was becoming clear for Villeneuve that he was losing the battle, and he ordered the northern portion of his line to move to the southwest and collapse on the British fleet. However, Just the captains of these ships. ships failed to see the signal, and this became the final mistake of the Allied fleet. Villeneuve's book in tour was in no shape to continue fighting, and Sorry, the I fleet over that. ordered the northern portion of his line to move to the southwest and collapse on the British fleet. However, the captains of these ships failed to see the signal, and this became the final mistake of the Allied fleet. Villeneuve's book in tour was in no shape to continue fighting, and soon he surrendered. By the time the remaining ten Allied ships started their move to assist, most of the vessels in the centre were either sunk or captured. Collingwood took overall command of the British Navy and ordered Nelson's squadron to intercept the French reinforcements. The remaining Allied ships decided to retreat. It was a complete victory, with the British capturing 18 enemy ships. Okay, so what I don't get here is that it looks like the British have just engaged that first line of ships at this point. So what is this second line back here? They're just kind of chilling out, not doing a whole lot. Why did those ships not like jump in and try to help out? And also I can imagine that surrendering on sea has to be like a logistical nightmare. <laughs> it's not like on land where you can just round up all the troops. With this you have to, I don't know, what do you even do? Like how do you handle surrenders at sea? Do you take all of the enemies off of their ship and put them onto your ship? Do you like escort their ships? somewhere. Like, what happens with a surrender? Nelson passed away as soon as he heard the news of the victory. Well, at least he got the French the defeat at Trafalgar confirmed the naval dominance of the United Kingdom and meant that Napoleon would not be able to invade Britain. But while the battle was raging at sea, the Emperor's Grand Army was moving into Germany against the Allied Austrian and Russian armies. He was moving into Germany. I thought that Germany didn't exist at this point. I thought that Prussia was kind of what Germany was. Thank you for watching our video on the Battle of Trafalgar. The second video in this series that will cover the Battle of Austerlitz will be released in two weeks. All right, well, we have already watched the video on Austerlitz, so we're going to kind of skip that one on Kings and Generals. We're going to head back to Epic History TV, maybe. I did have somebody tell me that I should watch something on Prussia 
I believe, before going back to the Napoleonic Wars. I don't remember what they said. I did write it down. I'll have to look it up. But if it makes sense for me to watch something on Prussia before we head back to Epic History TV, let me know. So yeah, that was actually very, very interesting. Very, very different from the land battles that I've been learning about. But if you guys can answer any of my questions in the comments below, you know the drill. I would really appreciate that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. Roger and I certainly appreciate you watching and your support. Looking forward to continuing with the Napoleonic Wars and we've got some other stuff coming up as well very shortly so stay tuned and we will see you next time.